Hello and welcome to my session. Uh, my name is Petar Puskarich and I'm going to be talking a little bit about the current state of smart port for the Apple II at present. Um, some of the caveats, some of the different options you have to actually bring smart port onto your uh, machines as well as um, how to do it rather cheaply and also a couple of the devices that you could be supporting uh, off of them. Um, it's been an interesting about year, year and a half as far as this particular topic is. Um, the development in it has been pretty rapid and um, most things are, I say 80% working the way they should be. And I'll discuss some of those with the different devices here in a couple minutes. Um, any, anywhere from being, you have to hit control open Apple reset on an Apple IIe uh, to get things to boot um, always, uh, to you have to update firmware on different devices to get things to work with the newer cards, like a Yellowstone. Um, and even then there's some new things that are coming out that still need to be patched to, to work with that card. So SmartPort as a protocol is also still being, let's say, I guess, I guess learned by the developers that are working on these projects. Um, a lot of it comes down to the, the, say the protocol and the timing of the pack, the actual smart port packets, and also different IDs that are on the, uh, the system per device as well, and when those are requested and how they're presented onto the bus. Um, it all seems to make a difference. Um, one thing I can start out with and basically just say that, well, what works perfectly? Well, what works perfectly so far in my experience is if you're using a real Lyron card on an Apple II or IIe, II Plus, yeah, or if you use an Apple II GS with its built-in smart port. The devices seem to work pretty well with it, um, at least the ones that I have. Uh, one of the devices I do not own is the W drive, um, but uh, I plan to buy one of those at some point in time. Um, I also do not own a booty, uh, but I believe it does things a little bit differently since it's a slot card itself. Um, so far, the devices that I have, uh, and I'll be showing those off here in a little bit, um, include the floppy EMU uh, from Big Mess of Wires, as well as his uh, Yellowstone card that just came out. Um, also have the latest prototype for the FujiNet, one, uh, FujiNet Zero, basically, for the Apple. And I also have what they call the SmartPort SD device, uh, which was updated to work with the Yellowstone recently by Robert Justice. But as of about an hour ago, it looks like that functionality quit working for some reason, at least in an Apple IIe Platinum. I will have to go back and double check and see if it still works on a regular Apple IIe. So maybe there's some other timing that's going on there that's causing that to fail. Um, but anyway, without further ado, um, let me show off a few of the devices and systems of what you can actually do. Transition this across. All right, so one of the things basically the say protocol standard will be essentially this device, which is a, a Lyron card. This one's my Lyron uh, 508 and has AS, as ASCO 508. I also have one that says the ASCO 007. So who knows, maybe that might be the James Bond edition. But that card is basically what you would use to normally boot up a smart port device if you have one. They are getting few and far between and they are getting expensive to buy on eBay if you can locate them. Um, past that, other devices that were out for smart port includes this nice little gem, which is going to be the Apple II three and a half disc controller card. Um, and its claim to fame basically is it is the only HD card that I'm aware of that will handle three and a half inch HD floppies on an Apple II. Um, you, can, you can do it with um, an AE card or an AE drive um, on the Apple II GS, uh, but you, you would still have for a regular Apple HD uh, Super Drive, you'd have to still use the three and a half inch uh, control card for that. And it's also a smart port standard as well since it has its own swim chip on it. All right, um, next up is going to be 
All right, so we can go into how we get smart, how you can get SmartPort on your machine. And there are a few different ways that you can do that. And one of the nice simpler ways is this tiny little card by KBook uh, or MFA2 uh, Mafia, um, which is, I think, the same people. Uh, but I think these are about like $19. And this one has what was called the V3 code base on it, which basically gives you the ability to redirect the smart port protocol from essentially any slot you would like where this card resides onto a disk two controller um, in slot six. And we can show that in a little bit. And then a good, to go along with that methodology, if you can't get a hold of that card, and they're hard to get a hold of right now uh, due to just production delays and, and whatnot, and the fact that they have to come in from overseas. So if you cannot get one of those cards, one of the things you can do is grab one of these cards, which is going to be a super serial card that I have. Oh, here we go. And unfortunately, this particular card, I have to swap chips here in a second. There we go. Basically, it's a standard super serial card, but you replace out the EEPROM, and it's a 2K EEPROM. Um, unfortunately, this would be the version one version of the do-it-yourself smart port ROM, um, which means that in order to get smart port on your Apple II, this card has to go in slot five only, and then your disk two still goes in, disk, in slot six. Um, and it pretty much works pretty well with a small caveat if you're boot, not booting from the smart port port. So that's the super serial card. Then the next jump up from that is going to be what's also popular, which is basically changing the ROM out on a old Grappler Plus printer card. And you can do that. You change it out with the PROM. It's a 4K EEPROM in this case. And this one is running version 4A of the smart port um, code. The 4A does not exist that I'm aware of for the actual KBU K uh, little, you know, tiny card. Um, I believe at some point, or it may be out by now, that uh, GG Labs, um, I believe, will have the uh, a version of it that has like the 4A code with it as well. Um, whenever that gets done, um, and that's been tested. All right, so the benefit of this particular version of card is that if you do not boot from slot five that has a smart port running on it, let's say you boot from place slot, say slot seven in this case to a real physical uh, ProDOS floppy, if you're not running the 4A code, it'll actually stall during loading for a while, and sometimes it'll crash uh, when it's trying to load in the smart port coding. Uh, 4A fixes that and it acts basically normally again. So you kind of really do want the 4A code base um, if you're booting from other slots besides your smart port. Okay, then basically on either of those solutions, what you're going to end up having is you're going to have a disk 2 controller of some sort inside your Apple II. And it can be the standard disk two with the IDC 20 plugs, or it can be the, slight, the slightly newer card. Let me get this back, there it is, with the DB19 on the end. So you can use that as well. But I caution you, if you're using any of these smart port things that are using uh, your disk two card as a uh, carry, carry way, uh, you do need to actually snip, there you go, pin 12, and that's the, like, that's that red wire here on this one, um, because if you're using a floppy EMU on it, um, over time, basically, it will burn out the floppy EMU, and you really don't want that. Now, it does not affect any other devices 
that I am aware of because that particular pin 12 um, for the other emulators usually becomes a no connection point. Um, and that pin generally is only used for actual real disk two as well. So when you go into smart port that kind of like the three and a half inch drive layout, um, that pin is just not used and it's usually not connected. So there's no harm, no foul there. Okay, and then finally we can get over to the new guy on the block, which is going to be the big mess of wires, Yellowstone card. And this is what it looks like. So I can get that up close at all. There you go. So it's a nice little card uh, produced very well. And I bought my kit uh, with the, uh, the extra cables and the, the converters. So the IDC 20 to uh, DB19 converters, which come in very handy for actually setting up all different kinds of different um, devices that, that if you want to connect them to the, uh, the newer card. Um, if you want to connect to a standard IDC 20 controller, you can still do that. And there's a, you know, the standard, you can still use it and then use the IDC 20 connections on the top. But again, that goes in, still goes in slot six and your, your ROM card you normally will go in slot five, but it can go, if you're using version, essentially version three and above, you can put it in any slot. Okay, so now let's get to, I guess, a couple devices that you could, in theory, hook up to your Apple II. So, you know, the, the standard one that was out for, you know, the very first ever, I believe, is still the Unidisc three and a half. And this will work on all the different solutions since it's smart port protocol. Um, I did have a little bit of difficulty getting it to work with the Yellowstone card, to be, to be honest, but that seems to be a quirk where you need to do control open Apple reset and then it'll actually boot it. It's kind of strange and I'm not sure exactly why that is happening that way. And it also affects the next little device I'm going to show you. Okay, let me separate it from its core. And this was one I included last year when it was brand new. All right, so this one in here. Let's see if this makes sense. This is essentially what they call the SmartPort SD card. This particular design is from um, Rodney Ross, and it was a, re, a remix based kind of um, from some work that, let's say, Catherine Stark, uh, Robert Justice, and um, there was the original group that built the very first set of them. Uh, I believe his name was Andrea, but I could be wrong. I can look that back up. Um, but what Robert, not Robert, sorry, what Rodney added to this device are the little LEDs um, down the down the middle here, um, which reflect uh, which boot drive is currently mapped in the smart port of the four that are in use. And you could have up to four different partitions. You copy the, the PO files or HDV files um, over to a SD card, and that's where they boot from. Um, it's a really handy device because it kind of just works. Um, except on the Yellowstone tonight, for whatever reason, on my Platinum 2E here. Um, that will need to be some, do some more research. Um, and I will share that here in a second. And we're doing great on time. All right, so as far as the smart port devices that I've got to hook up to these, here's my, my well, I'll get that last actually. And here's the quintessential one that basically a lot of people are using, which is the big mess of wires floppy EMU. If the camera actually gets that, I get it right, right across. Uh, mine's a revision B. Uh, he has revision C out now as well. It has some extra, extra little features from what I'm aware of. Um, I'm running mine without the case because of all the cable swaps that I do uh, with it for different testing. And one thing I have found is that the floppy EMU across the, the different 
smart port cards and hookup possibilities, the slower the SD card, the better for the floppy EMU, which is kind of bizarre, but that's what I've been finding. Um, it also appears if you push the floppy EMU too hard IO rate wise. So like if you do a verification from uh, ProDOS um, under uh, say like copy two plus um, 8.4, it will basically start throwing bad blocks on the verify, um, which other devices just do not do. So I think there's either a buffer issue there or he does some timing things just a little bit differently that, that happen every now and then. And that will show up sometimes, especially if you're using total replay, which is the 32 meg volume with the uh, whole slew of games on it that everyone likes to, to run you know, with smart, their smart port because, well, it's 32 megs of everything almost uh, that you'd ever want to play with. Um, it will actually cause crashes and screen corruptions every now and then. Um, so something to, something to watch out for. Um, it, one very interesting thing to note is that, again, on the Apple II GS with its native smart port and also on the Lyron card, those particular traits do not manifest. So you can you can actually validate the floppy EMU against a Lyron, it'll be just perfectly fine. If you validate it against a the Yellowstone card or the other solutions, the, the different DIY SP cards, um, it'll 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 throw blocks. And they're not actually bad; they're just being reported as bad uh, because of their apparently they're missing some something in the protocol timing is what is my guess whether it's buffer related or timing um so that's some of the things i've noticed going on with the uh, smart port and then finally the very last app apple smart port device that i have that i'm really happy to show actually is this is a rev zero fuji apple and let me throw it up here and it's a standard DB19 smart port port. It's got Wi-Fi, and I believe it's a ESP32. Um, it uh, has an onboard SD card if you want to load from the SD card as well. And the really cool part about this is this, this gives multiple devices to smart port for the very first time, at least implemented for the first time. It's part of the protocol, but it's never really been done by Apple or anybody that I'm aware of. So we have a network device, uh, a character device, um, and then also the block devices for the protocol. Um, there will be some more demos on Friday of the device uh, with Jeff Peepmeyer. Um, and I'll be doing some of the demos while he's given the presentation on this particular card. So what I wanna basically show is let's, let's hook some of this stuff up. So first off, let me take a DB19 and throw that in slot six. So that's a standard five and a quarter controller. All right. And then I'm going to put the Fuji on it. I'll run through that quick and then I'll also do the, the smart port SD. So we have that connected there. And as I knock over everything, beautiful. All right. So there's a little bit better view of the Apple II for now. Well, as I block it. All right. So there's the, the FujiNet attached to the disk two card. So then let's go put the grappler card here in slot five. All right, so make sure nothing grounded out. So there's that there. And with that, that's really all we need to do. So let's turn it on. And then with this, it's still, I'll do a, control reset because normally you have to do a control reset or control open Apple reset, depending on what machines you're using in order to have it time enough and also for the ROM to load if you're not booting from a different slot. 
So let's do, let me move this back around. Oops. So let's do PR number five. And then this will be loading up a config file off the smart port. So we have network devices and then these four uh, FujiNet uh, disk, basically your standard four smart port ports. Hit return. And so let's just go and see what happens. Oh, look, we can actually go to an online data store. Uh, this is FujiNet.online, their server, and it's running a um, tiny uh, TFNS or TNFS uh, server. So it's uh, really lightweight and you can host all kinds of little files from it. So they have one up on DigitalOcean. So we're actually hitting the remote instance. And let's go ahead and just pull up Total Replay. So we got it, we got to load. Let's load it as read only. And it says, go ahead and boot. So now we do that. We'll do the control reset after it's loaded and do PR number five. And there you go. So hopefully this will start loading here. And I had an issue, yep, there it goes. So it's loading completely off of the volumes and digital ocean. Um, and then it'll go into the attract mode and whatnot. And you can say hit W and it should, uh, yep, there goes, there's the wargle. If we hit escape, it'll go back. So it loads the full and it will access by, by block the information that it needs to pull in. So that's pretty cool. So let's hit, let's hit D and see if we can just load a game and a droll and then we hit return. And it'll go ahead and access that off of that 32 meg volume in the cloud. And that's all over Wi-Fi configurable as well. So it's going against my local Wi-Fi then out over the internet and it yep, pulled in the game. So there you go. All right, so let's go ahead and drop off of that for a second. And then I want to show you the same thing off of local SD card off of the smart port SD. Uh, get back. There we go. So the smart port SD, and that's going to plug directly into the DB19 port. All right, I hang that off the back out of the way. And then we basically just boot that up. And it's going to do the same thing because it's going to try to do an auto search and try to do basically it's trying to read this slot six and it can't because we need to actually pull it from the smart port, which is PR number five. And lo and behold, there it pops right up, goes back into our total replay. Um, it just things just work really, really slick. Um, let's go from that one. And then I think finally, with the amount of time I got left here. Let me pull these cards out and I can show you the difference on the Yellowstone card if it decides to play nice. So on the Yellowstone card, I'm going to put the same one I just had there, which is the SmartPort SD. We're gonna throw the Yellowstone in slot five by itself. And then we're gonna boot. And interestingly enough, it doesn't like auto boot in this mode with that card. And that's the thing with the floppy EMU, it will actually auto boot. So do control open Apple reset. And here's where it'll actually do the boot. It's probably something with the way the Yellowstone is searching for drives or looking for that ID byte or something. Uh, I think there still needs to be a little bit more of engineering done to figure out exactly how to make all these interactions consistent. Um, that's one of the frustrating things I've been having testing all these is trying to figure out, okay, is it broken? Is it not broken? Or I'm just not doing the right magic salute to uh, make it work. So there's smart port SD off of a Yellowstone and it, yeah, it works, works very well. Okay, so get that loaded, make sure the access is done. All right, so let me remove that. And finally, I will then hook up, let me 
let's see, I need to find its cable end. Okay, we'll steal that back from the FujiNet. And then we'll connect that in via the DB19 to DB19 male female. And then this is for the floppy EMU. We'll boot it. And you'll notice that this time it actually did the auto boot off the floppy EMU for the same image. Um, so obviously there's something a little go different going on. And most likely because Big Mesa Wires basically develop both products. So between the two, they, see, they seem to be, be working pretty well. Um, the only issue I've had with um, SmartPort with those two, these two products together is still the fact that if I do a ProDOS volume verify, if I put in a very fast SD card, it'll actually blow even more invalid blocks during that check, which they're not actually invalid. It's just there's something wrong with the data stream as it's pulling it off, uh, whether it's timing or something else going on there. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much a very fast walkthrough of SmartPort uh, and what's available for it. Um, I will con continue to uh, provide any new updates to the SmartPort DIY SP as I get them. And Wang Young is the, uh, the brainchild behind the fixes um, as I'm finding them and reporting them back to him, um, is making some of these work even better. Um, and again, that the 4A code set for the DIY SP4A, um, that EEPROM basically allows you to boot without drive hesitation from a different slot. So if you're booting from your CFFA 3000 or a five and a quarter floppy drive uh, physical, and then jumping across to see your smart port ports, um, it fixes the issue with the hang or stalling during boot that you would see with version one, version two, and version three. Um, version one is the only one that fits on the super serial card. And version three is the only one released so far, the latest one released for the KBU HK uh, smart port ROM card. So then 4A for the Grappler Plus replacements. And that's the one I actually do recommend. And I can uh, include those files as well. Um, Again, I guess I would like to uh, thank you for uh, sitting through the presentation and um, hopefully uh, you can have a little more information on SmartPort in general. Um, and uh, please uh, ask many questions as you want and I'll be around for a little bit. Thank you very much. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, so um, Petar is here. I guess you are there, spotlighted live. There is um, There is a question in the Zoom Q&A if you um, yeah. So, do you want me to read it? Or... Uh, sure, if you want, and then I'll answer. Okay. So, um, this is John <laughs> uh, writes. Uh, has anyone reached out to the ROMX people to see if the SP ROM could be added that right that way, the SmartPort ROM? I am not aware of anyone that has actually. It might be an interesting proposition uh, to see if that can all be moved across. Could you provide yes, there a list of uh, vendors? <laughs> I can put together one and throw it on the uh, Discord uh, channel um, after a bit tonight, after I get back from a family obligation. But yeah, I can at least list all the ones that I'm aware of and uh, possibly where to hunt them down and get them. Um, yeah, I've been extremely lucky to find some of the devices I have and, and that I can unfortunately, um, I don't have a W drive yet, um, which I hear when I send out request for a different test that I do, that the W drive also passes them uh, the same way that the uh, SmartPort SD does. So that's encouraging. But yeah, sure, I can do that. Thanks. Actually, um, I'm looking at the, the Discord channel, and Scott said, uh, putting a ROM 4X into my TC was one of the best upgrades I've made on it, SmartPort support and booting. So does it, maybe it already does it. It possibly could. Um, Actually, to be honest, all of my 2Cs have either the 4X or 5X uh, in the 2C uh, platforms that I have, but I have yet to actually put any of the devices on any of them, since I'm primarily a 2E and 2GS uh, user at heart. Um, I haven't gone full Javier yet on the 2C, so I'll get there eventually. Uh, but yeah, I have a feeling I'll be digging into the internals of basically all the different implementations on these devices and yeah 
maybe we'll find that the um, the four X will uh, support it just fine. All right, it was great, everybody. Thank you for having me.